Hi there. My name's Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last lecture of EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing, we explored using Z transforms to gain insight into the frequency responses of FIR filters. At the end of the last lecture, we looked at a simple nulling filter. In this lecture, we'll look at a more complicated example of a nulling filter. Let's consider a design problem where we want to create a low-pass FIR filter that will completely kill digital frequencies of 0.7 pi, 0.8 pi, and 0.9 pi. To start with, we might ask, what filter length do we need? Because that filter length corresponds to computational complexity. Z transforms provide a tool for thinking about these kinds of problems. So in general, if we want to kill off three frequencies, we're going to need six zeros because each frequency will need a conjugate pair of poles. The only exceptions would be a mega hat equals zero, which corresponds to DC, or omega hat equals pi, which corresponds to the Nyquist frequency. So to get six zeros, we need a sixth order FIR filter, so we need to find seven coefficients. We see that we need to place zeros at these locations on the unit circle. So let's dig into the nitty gritty of how to find these coefficients in general. Let's first think about a simple first order filter. In this particular case, we have a zero at A. If you want to place things on the unit circle and you want your coefficients to be real, well then you've only got two places that you could put your zero. If we put the zero at one, that corresponds to blocking DC. But if you put your zero at minus one, that corresponds to blocking omega hat equals pi. If you want to think about blocking some frequency other than zero or pi, then you need to think about complex conjugate pairs. So here I have one zero at e to the j 0.8 pi, and here I have a zero at e to the minus j 0.8 pi. Notice in setting up this structure, I'm putting a couple of poles at the origin. So multiplying this out, I wind up with a z squared that combines with this z to the minus two to give me a one here. Now if I look at these final terms, the minus signs cancel, and this multiplied by this gives me one. So, multiplying by this, I wind up with a z to the minus 2 here. Now let's think about the cross terms. So I'll have e to the j something times e to the minus j something, and that should automatically make you think of the inverse Euler's formula for cosine. So I can write that as 2 cosine 0.8 pi here for this z to the minus 1 term, and be careful not to forget the minus. And this kind of structure shows up over and over in digital signal processing. So we wind up with a filter with coefficients 1, 1 1.618, 1. And the second order filter will completely kill off a frequency of omega hat equals 0.8 pi. So if you want to block a whole bunch of different frequencies, you can use the same basic idea. You just multiply these forms representing these zeros together. Now, the way to interpret these two factors in front is that you include them if you need them. If you don't need to block DC, you get rid of this one. If you don't need to block the Nyquist frequency, that's the sample rate divided by two, you don't have this one. Because these are occurring in complex conjugate pairs, we wind up with real coefficients when you multiply this out. Now, one issue is that although you will zero the frequencies you want, you don't really have much control over what's happening elsewhere. So working it out for this particular example, we want to null 0.7 pi, 0.8 pi, and 0.9 pi. And multiplying all of that out, we wind up with an FIR filter with these coefficients. Recall that for FIR filters, there's this direct correspondence between the impulse response and the filter coefficients. And that's not true for the infinite impulse response filters we'll look at later. So when we plot the magnitude response, it looks like this. Now, in most of the frequency domain plots we've made in this class, we've plotted the vertical axis on a linear scale. Here we're using a decibel scale, which is a logarithmic scale, so we can better see low-level details. And we can see that there's these nice nulls. And the filter could be overall described as having a low-pass characteristic. Now, we don't spend a lot of time in EC 2026 talking about phase plots, 
The one thing to note here is that there are these jumps of pi radians at these zeros. Notice that the vertical axis here is in degrees. And the overall structure of the plot is that of a line. We will describe this as a linear phase filter. Don't let these little jumps of pi throw you. If you can stitch together a line by collapsing out those jumps of pi, you'll still call it linear phase. Now, when we use the word linear in terms of a linear phase filter, that's a different use of the word linear than when we talk about the linearity property of systems. You can have linear time invariant systems that are not linear phase. For an FRR filter to have linear phase, the coefficients either need to have even symmetry, as you see here, or odd symmetry. Let's see, if I wanted to make something that was odd symmetric, I could change this to a minus, I could change this to a minus, and then change this to a minus. So minus, minus, minus. That would be an example of a set of filter coefficients with odd symmetry. The SP First Toolbox, which you can download from the DSP First website, contains a demo called PEZ. Oh, you can actually download it separately. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. You can enter the locations of zeros and poles, drag them around, and look at the effect on the frequency response and the impulse response. Something that I think would be really cool is if we had a plugin like this for digital audio workstation software where you could move the poles and zeros around and hear the effect on music in real time. After all, when you're using an equalizer plugin in your DAW, the software is moving poles and zeros around behind the scenes. I think it would be very educational to expose those details. Now, there is a little bit of ambiguity here. My original design criteria just said that I needed to null out these frequencies. I could take this system function and scale it by the number 37, in which case I would just scale all of the coefficients here by 37, and I would still be nulling those frequencies. One thing you could do is add up all of these coefficients to get the frequency response at DC, and then divide all the coefficients by that value to normalize your filter to have unity gain at DC. Or you could do something else. It depends on your application. There are a lot of different approaches to filter design. One of them is the Parks-McClellan algorithm, co-developed by my colleague Jim McClellan, who co-authored the curriculum for this course. Here's an example of a bandpass filter designed using windowing techniques that includes 23 zeros, so it has a length of 24. There's a stop band here and another stop band here, along with the conjugate pairs. Here we have a pass band, and here we have a pass band, and then here we have transition regions. So looking at the pole zero plot, we see this chunk of zeros here that are handling the lower stop band. These zeros are handling the upper stop band. And these zeros are a little weird. They're kind of guiding the behavior in the pass band. They are pulling down the frequency response, but they're not super close to the unit circle, so they're not having a super strong effect. Big picture, for FIR filters, the Z transforms give us a convenient way to relate time domain behavior with frequency domain behavior. We're going to very soon start our study of infinite impulse response filters, where Z transforms are also going to play a vital role and we will continue to draw great utility from the Z-transform properties.